Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Newspapers.com makes it easy to find your family's story. With more than half a billion digitized newspaper pages from the 1690s to today. Search for obituaries, marriage announcements, birth announcements, photos, and more in papers from across the United States, the UK, Canada, and beyond, stretching back three generations. For listeners of this podcast, Newspapers.com is offering 20% off a Publisher Extra subscription. Just use the coupon code FAMILYTREEMAGAZINE at checkout. That's code FAMILYTREEMAGAZINE, all one word, for 20% off Publisher Extra. Hello and welcome to the February 2023 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. In this episode, we're going to head over to our local library and author Anna Rose Johnson is our guide. She'll be sharing some of the ideas from her new article, Using Local Libraries to Maximize Your Search Potential. Then in the Family History Home segment, we're heading to the kitchen to explore and preserve our culinary history with Denise May Levenick. Uh, we are going to also stop by the desk of Family Train Magazine's digital editor, Melina Papadopoulos. She's added some great new genealogy resource pages to the website, and she's here to tell us about it. As always, there's a lot to cover, so we'll start things off with some tree talk with Family Train Magazine's social media editor, Rachel Christian. There's always a lot going on in the world of genealogy, and here to tell us more about it is Rachel Christian, social media editor at Family Tree Magazine. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I know uh, it's a, a busy first month of the year of 2023, and I imagine that there's lots going on. What has caught your eye in the news? Yes, I've got a few items um, from the past few weeks that our readers won't want to miss, starting with some troubling news from the USCIS otherwise known as the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, On January 4th, there was a new fee hike that was proposed that would increase the cost of record searches up to as much as 85%. For example, the cost of an index search request would increase from $65 to $100. The legal genealogist, Judy Russell, has more information on her blog, as well as some suggestions for how her Listeners can speak out against the fee hikes, so we'll be sure to have a link in the description box below for that. Another big story comes from ProPublica, which is a nonprofit newsroom that investigates and reports on abuses of power. Their journalist Seth Fried Wessler published an article last month. The title is, Developers Found Graves in the Virginia Woods. Authorities Then Helped Erase the Historic Black Cemetery. And this article is about um, a historic black cemetery that was found in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. And it was after years of going back and forth with the company that wanted to purchase the land that it was on, the cemetery was cleared. It was erased to make room for a Microsoft data center, despite the federal and state regulations in place to protect it. So it was a several year struggle. The article was just published last month. It really blows open the issue of cemetery erasure, and I would recommend giving that a read if you are so inclined. And finally, to end on some good news, the Center for Jewish History has launched a new project that will provide free DNA test kits to both Holocaust survivors and their children. It's an ongoing effort to help reconnect families that were separated by that tragedy and help forge family connections that maybe people weren't aware of. So that is a great project. We'll have links to that as well. And I'd recommend checking that out if you or someone you know might benefit from that. Terrific. Well, lots going on this this month and lots going on in this episode. We're always so happy when you kick us off and uh, everybody listening can check out the show notes for links to all the details on the items that you mentioned. Thanks so much, Rachel. Great talking to you. Thank you, Lisa. Sometimes the best genealogy resources can be found in our own backyard. 
And that's why I've invited the author of the new upcoming article, Using Local Libraries to Maximize Your Search Potential, to the podcast. Author Anna Rose Johnson is here to give us some strategies for the best ways to use our local libraries in our own genealogy research. Welcome to the show, Anna. Thank you so much for having me. I think this is a terrific and a really important topic. And, you know, we all know that our local library has uh, a wonderful array of books that they may have on hand. But what other kinds of resources should we be looking for at our local library? Yes, libraries are really full of a lot of fascinating resources that genealogists can use. And some of them you might not think of, you know, right off the top of your head. But what I have found in researching in libraries is that there are often really helpful resources there. I would say that aside from books, you know, because they can often have, you know, local histories and genealogical books in their collections, but they also often have archives of local history, such as city directories and school yearbooks. I found those um, are often in libraries, and I have really enjoyed looking at those. And I think that being able to look at um, local newspapers, those are in libraries as well. And, you know, sometimes you're not always able to find those local papers online for whatever town you're researching. And libraries are really good places to look for those and photos as well. A lot of times they'll have collections of local photos um, that sometimes you'll be able to find your ancestors in. So those are some of the, some of the first really good resources to check out. That's a really good point. And sometimes those photo collections aren't like sitting on a shelf where it's really obvious. You have to Mm -hmm. ask. I remember going one time to a local library and saying, do you by chance have any file cabinets back there that may have some local pictures? And They did. They had a file drawer of unidentified houses. I ended up finding the Victorian house that we had just bought in a photo that was 100 years old. You know, so it was really uh, neat. It's so we should be kind of maybe asking for things that even aren't necessarily right there on the shelf. Yes, absolutely. I think that um, just knowing, you know, what to ask for, just asking, you know, what kinds of uh, genealogy you know, records are available in the library. Um, Yeah, they might have things that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of. Another thing that's really helpful in libraries is that a lot of the time they will have connections to where you'll be able to search uh, like Ancestry.com and other subscription sites. I believe uh, ProQuest is one. You'll be able to look into those sites Um, through the library access. And then you'll be able to look at records that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise if you don't already have a subscription to those sites. So that's really helpful, as well as being able to get records through interlibrary loan. Um, Sometimes you'll be able to get like microfilm records from other libraries. You know, you'll be able to get those into your own local library um, to be able to search for those offline records. So yeah, those are really wonderful ways to utilize the library. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the websites. And I think uh, many people who've kind of been at Genealogy Well are aware of that libraries will have certain subscriptions. Mm -hmm. It's always worth asking, though, I really agree, because sometimes they come and they go. Right. Yes. So the, you know, last year they didn't have Find My Past, but this year they mm-hmm. do. And you mentioned ProQuest, which really isn't something that we subscribe to ourselves as individuals, but this is something unique to libraries. So definitely worth stopping by the resource desk and asking what kinds of websites they have that access to. And you mentioned the interlibrary loan. I imagine that that uh, librarian sitting at the resource desk could be really helpful in even expanding beyond that, just helping us maybe figure out what's out there and what we should be asking of other libraries, maybe ones that are closer to where our ancestors actually lived. Yes, for sure. And that's what is so, you know, wonderful about using libraries is that, you know, you can 
go find, you know, where the library is, you know, in like an ancestor's hometown, you know, check out what kinds of records they have. And then sometimes you'll be able to get those sent to your own library. They're really wonderful ways of, you know, tracking down those harder to find items. And one thing that I find super helpful is the actual library websites, because a lot of the time, a library will put up some of those uh, records and photos and books um, available, just put them up so that researchers can look through their site and then, you know, be able to find useful links. And, you know, some of those records that you're looking for, they often just have up on the website. And when I discovered that, you know, doing my research, I realized, you know, what a treasure trove can be kind of hidden away on some of these sites. You know, if you're just willing to look through and see what they have, sometimes you can find really cool things. Absolutely. And it's interesting. Do you find that the websites, they vary a lot, don't they? It's not like we get so used to going to Ancestry, it's always behaving the same. But every website for each library can be different. Do you have any special ways that you kind of go at it to get more quickly to what you're looking Mm -hmm. for? Yes. Uh, What I found is that a lot of the time, um, they'll have genealogy records under certain tabs. You know, sometimes they'll be labeled research or, you know, history resources, local archives. So if you can kind of look for some of those keywords, like in a drop down of links, then those will often take you to um, the more interesting part of the site where you'll be able to find more of the genealogy centric parts of the site. And sometimes, you know, you'll be able to find just, you know, links to other local websites, like a gen web page, sometimes they'll have those listed, you know, which aren't always easy to find just, you know, on your own. Um, sometimes they'll have links to like Newsbank or other places that house local papers. And sometimes they'll have like photo collections, you know, they'll link to like a collection on Flickr. So yeah, if you just kind of know some of the words to look for, you know, research, obviously being one of the best ones, if you can find that, then you can usually find some pretty good stuff. Yeah, I always enjoy going to Google. So I'll go to Google and I'll just type in the name of the library and put search help. Right. And sometimes that finds that single page that's sitting on their website that actually explains Mm -hmm. the best way to use their search operators or to navigate. Great ideas. Finally, I'm guessing that where there's lots of benefits to not only having a library card with our local library, but potentially at the library in the largest city next to us or at the library where our ancestors lived. What kinds of benefits do you see is far as getting the library cards and do they give us access online as well? Yes. um, I definitely think that that can be helpful because sometimes uh, resources are restricted for access if, you know, if you don't have a card. So yeah, like being able to access uh, genealogical subscription sites, you will need a card in order to do that. So yes, sometimes it's easier if you can do that. And yeah, like you said, getting a card at you know, a bigger nearby library that may have, you know, more records, you know, on hand, more of a genealogy collection than being able to have, you know, the greater access to that could end up helping a lot. Yeah, it never hurts to ask. All they can do is say, oh, we can't do that if you don't live here. But you know, it's surprising, I think, particularly after the last couple of years that more libraries have maybe loosen some of those restrictions and and allowing people to obtain cards. Mm-hmm. So well worth the ask. Well, this is really helpful, kind of gets us reinvigorated to go visit not only our local library, but maybe even make a visit to the library that was local to where our family once lived. Anna Rose Johnson's article is going to be called Using Local Libraries to Maximize Your Search Potential. Now, that's going to be published uh, exclusively on the FamilyTreeMagazine.com website. So we'll look forward to that. Anna Rose, thanks so much. It's a wonderful reminder to get back to our local library. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Well, as you heard at the top of the show, this episode is sponsored by newspapers.com. And uh, I've invited Jenny Ashcraft back to the podcast to tell us a little bit more about what we can look forward to over at newspapers.com. Hi, Jenny. How are you, Lisa? I am great. And we are just so thrilled to have you uh, collaborating with us. And it's, it's interesting because newspapers, when we think about them, we often think about our ancestors' obituaries. But there is so much more in old newspapers, isn't there? Boy, there really is. I mean, obituaries and wedding indexes, they're incredible, but they're just the tip of the iceberg of all that newspapers.com has to offer. You know, newspapers are traditionally black and white print, but I can tell you from my personal experience that nothing brings more color to your family tree than the stories that you find in newspapers.com. In just seconds, you can search more than 800 million pages of newspapers from across the United States and around the world, and they date back to 1690. I mean, just imagine finding your ancestor in the paper. Maybe he or she wrote a letter to the editor or appeared in the society pages or made the game-winning shot. Uh, Newspapers reported on everything, like who was on the sick list and who was coming to dinner. I I love the personality and the connection that these details bring to my family history research. Let me tell you just a quick little amazing discovery that I made just a few weeks ago using newspapers.com. I was researching one of my ancestors. His name was David McKissick. Well, David lived in New Alexandria, Pennsylvania. And around 1870, he just disappeared from the records. I mean, where did he go? Did he move? Was he maybe a Civil War casualty? I I searched records everywhere and I couldn't find him. And I started looking in newspapers all around his hometown and I couldn't find him. Well, I decided to expand my search beyond Pennsylvania And an 1876 article in the Sacramento Bee caught my eye. The paper reported that a teamster who had just arrived in town about four days earlier, named David McKissick, had been found dead in his hotel room. He'd come to Sacramento seeking a a, a mild climate because he was suffering from consumption. And we know that that's tuberculosis. So the coroner arrived and he found Um, a letter and some money in this man's pocket. And this letter seemed to be written from a close relative, and but it didn't have a name. And it was signed, The Old Home. And it had a postmark, New Alexandria, Pennsylvania. Well, that one little line, that postmark, it was just, it was like a voice from the dust. It was the clue that I needed to discover that this was my ancestor. And to confirm this suspicion, I found a probate record and I saw all his family members listed as heirs. Well, tragically, David died alone and at a young age. But thanks to this newspaper article, he is no longer forgotten by our family. I love newspapers.com. I have made so many personal discoveries and added hundreds of names to my family tree. If you head over to newspapers.com today, you can start uncovering stories about your family. Wow, that's a terrific example of the wonderful things that we can find over at newspapers.com. For those of you listening, we have a wonderful discount available for you. Uh, if you use coupon code Family Tree Magazine at newspapers.com, you can get 20% off the Publisher Extra subscription over at newspapers.com. Thank you so much, Jenny, for inspiring us in our research. Thank you, Lisa. In today's Family History Home segment, we're heading to the kitchen to explore and preserve our culinary history. Denise May Levinick has loads of ideas for us from her column that is in the January and February 2023 issue of Family Tree Magazine. And she's here today to tell us more about it. Welcome back to the podcast, Denise. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me here. Oh, well, thank you for being here. I love this topic of heirloom kitchenware because it reminds me of many happy hours in the kitchen with my mom and my grandmothers. Our pots and pans and our Tupperware is pretty nostalgic, isn't it? 
It sure is. A lot of us have kept little odd utensils or kitchen tools, and um, they just bring back such memories. Food can kind of be emotional, and then we're spending time with our our loved ones and our families. So, um, yeah, definitely gets us in that nostalgic mode. I was thinking about that many of us have things that were given to us, let's say when we first got married, and then we have stuff in our cupboards that uh, we've been buying over the years. So we have kind of a mix of old and new. What kinds of items should we be looking for, keeping an eye out for in our cupboards? I like to look for things that have a story and a memory attached. And that's not really too hard. I think a lot of us will see something in our mother's or grandmother's cupboards, kitchens, and immediately that triggers a memory. I know my mom had a big bowl. It was the biggest bowl in our kitchen. And when I look at it now, it's not so huge. It was a kind of pottery, sort of an orangish color. Bauer, I think, was the pottery maker. And it had little ridges around it. And that was the bowl she always made chocolate chip cookies in with a wooden spoon or a little hand mixer with a, you know, the two beaters that you would push on. Yes. And so when, after she passed away and my sister and I were clearing up her kitchen, I said, oh, I want this bowl. My sister said, well, fine, you can <laughs> have it, especially because it has a crack in it. But it's still okay. It still makes great chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> The crack is part of the character, isn't it? It is. It is. And it's. it just reminds me, too, that her chocolate chip cookies were not the ones on the back of the Toll House package. They were something different. And when I asked her about the recipe, she uh, sent it to me or gave me her cookbook or something. And it's kind of a Depression-era cookie. It has a lot of oatmeal in it. And it's not made with butter. It's made with uh, Crisco. So, <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. You know, it's funny. I You talk about items having stories. I have a, a cookie jar that I got from my grandmother on my father's side. And she was a, a absolute, uh, I'm going neat freak. She, she was very, very fastidious, very clean. She cleaned all the time. And it's so funny. I was talking to an antiques dealer and I was showing them the cookie jar and she's like, your grandmother was very, very uh, clean oriented, wasn't she? I said, yes. How did you know that? And she's like, this cookie jar used to be fully painted. <laughs> she has scrubbed all the paint off this thing. <laughs> and all what you have left is the ceramic. <laughs> and I thought, that is so funny because that is absolutely her story. So, of course, when she passed, um, I very much was excited to take that cookie jar home. Something else I think about is Tupperware. And here I was having the idea that Tupperware came around the 60s, but it was actually in the 40s. So most of us have had some exposure or at least have one Tupperware item in our kitchen. Is there anything that we can do to preserve or restore Tupperware? Oh my gosh, I just love Tupperware. My friends kind of <laughs> laughed at me as we got a little older and... Uh, and, you know, I always had a secret desire to be a Tupperware lady. I thought it would be so <laughs> fun. <laughs> yes. I just, so social. I, I loved all these colorful containers. You know, they would get you organized because just having them would make you organized, right? <laughs> right. But, um, you know, as, as I still have a few pieces, I've kind of let some of it move on, but it gets sticky after a time. Uh, because maybe we don't keep it washed or it gets just dusty or whatever. But you can revive um, that sticky plastic by sort of washing it with a mixture of vinegar and water. I didn't know that until I did a little research. And use a little baking soda to scrub off stains if you need to. But it was wonderful stuff. <laughs> Oh, it was. And it came in so many forms and so many colors. And you're right. I mean, it was almost like a social event. Oh, when it the was. Tupperware lady would come to your house. It was. And remember the crazy little odd tools they would have? The gadgets that you would get when you went to yes. a Tupperware party. That was what oh, was wonderful. So fun. 
Well, now something else that many of us may have, um, maybe in the back of the the cupboard, but it's there is cast iron. I know I have one big old cast iron pan that's very old, and that can be preserved if you pay a little attention to it, can't it? Right. You never want to soak it in water, of course. Right. And mostly it just needs a, a quick rinse with some water or maybe to be wiped out with a damp paper towel. Of course, it depends on if you've seasoned it well. And for a lot of people who are real compulsive about cleaning, they don't really like cast iron because it can't get soaked and all that kind. Uh, it just needs to be seasoned with a light coating of oil. I was surprised to discover when uh, my mother-in-law passed away and we had an estate sale that her cast iron was highly collectible. I didn't know it until I found people fighting in the kitchen over the things, some <laughs> of the frying pans. Yeah. It's definitely do, worth doing a little research if you have some very old vintage cast iron and taking good care of it. Absolutely. And there, there's always going to be a certain amount of just wear and tear. We shouldn't be striving to necessarily try to bring it back to its original condition, right? That's part of the character. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's You want that patina on cast iron. That's how you know it was a good piece. It's got some, uh, you know, it's totally nonstick before we had Teflon. Yes. It, wood items, you know, they have a lovely glow that like salad bowls and spoons and that kind of thing. Well, and that makes me think of utensils. I would think that utensils are some of the most common things that are still sitting in our drawers, even after, you know, different Tupperware pieces have made their way into the garbage or whatever. Oh, we, sure. we might still have that big wooden fork or spoon. Uh, any suggestions there for how we might preserve and care for those? Or rolling pin. That's something that's commonly yes. passed on. And I found a rolling pin in my grandmother's things that somebody had put a tag on that it belonged to the grandmother before. The wood is totally smooth by now. It's so old. And uh, with all wooden things, of course, like a little like cast iron, you don't want to soak them in water. Just give them a, a light cleaning and kind of polish them with a cloth because the patina is really lovely. You can use a little mineral oil to bring back some of the moisture in the wood if you need to. But I don't know. what What's your favorite kitchen tool? I bet you have one too. You know, it's funny. I have a little, I think you mentioned it, like it's like an egg beater. Oh yeah. Whisk. The circular handle and the two beaters are ro it's a rotating beater. Oh. And the beauty of it was, is when I just have fond memories of watching my grandmother use it. But two, when the power goes out, <laughs> I can still make stuff. You know what I mean? I, it's really interesting. Some things are not maybe as on a daily basis as practical or as efficient, but I still want them in my kitchen. So what I've been doing lately, Denise, is using them decoratively. And, you know, uh, I, I bought a wire basket at an antique store, hung it by the bottom of it onto the wall, and then started hanging some of these items and attaching them with wire so that they're on display. But, you know, when the power goes out, I might take one down and use it. That's a great idea. They're so fun to see and they bring back such fond memories. It's nice to have them out where you can enjoy them. Absolutely. Well, everybody, you need to get into your kitchen, start crawling around the back of the cupboards and see what you might have because it's all family history. And you can turn to Denise's article. It's in the January, February 2023 issue of Family Tree Magazine. Her family history home column appears there each issue. And in that particular issue, it's called Saving Heirloom Kitchenware. And she's got some great items there and some great advice. Always fun to talk to you, Denise. Thank you so much for uh, helping us out in the kitchen today. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for inviting me to talk about really my favorite topic, kitchenware. <laughs> <laughs> And, oh, I want to encourage everybody, go check out um, Denise's website and blog. She's got a few more articles on this topic. So it's thefamilycurator.com. Thanks again, Denise. Thanks. Bye-bye. Before we wrap up this episode, let's stop by the desk of Melina Papadopoulos, Family Tree Magazine's digital editor. Hi, Melina. Hi, Lisa. 
Hey, I know you've been busy bringing new content uh, to the Family Tree Magazine website. What kinds of new resources should we be checking out these days? Yeah, so since we're starting a new year here in 2023, I definitely have been focusing on how to help people find the resources they need and the tools they need to jumpstart their um, genealogy research plans in the new year and get get all they need ready to um, really make the most of their family history searches. So what I've been working on is two different landing pages filled with great resources. One is our tools landing page, which will focus mostly on websites, books, databases, and other resources and how to use them and um, where to find them so that people can use them to as they do their um, genealogy research. And the other one is related to strategy, which is more focused on how to um, go about researching your family history, how to get over challenges, and how to um, navigate confusing records and so on. So the goal here with both of these landing pages and, and all the resources that are contained with the, on them is to ensure that people have one place to go to find the resources they need and um, hopefully make the most of 2023 as a year to get some really major and impactful research done. Yes, absolutely. It's it's so nice when you kind of uh, pull that vast amount of resources that you guys have on the website, kind of together in one place so that people can drill down. I know we'll have a link in the show notes to both the strategies and the tools landing pages. If they just go to familytreemagazine.com, can they get there through the menu as well? Absolutely. If you go to our thefamilytree.magazine.com website, you will find um, our the Explore by Topic menu. If you just hover over that and scroll, um, look all the way to the bottom, there'll be a link for tools right above, right at below, uh, right at the bottom of the um, that, that menu. And then below that will be it's the strategies page. So you can just click, go right there on the website and click those links and you'll be able to um, navigate those and explore those freely. Terrific. All right. Well, that's at familytreemagazine.com and we'll have links directly to both those pages in our show notes. Thanks so much. Keep up the great work. We love being able to so easily access all the, the great content over at the website. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for joining me for this February 2023 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast from America's number one genealogy magazine. I'll have links on the show notes page to everything that we talked about today. And you can find those show notes at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. Now, don't forget to subscribe to the new Family Tree Magazine Best Websites podcast in your favorite podcast directory or app. And uh, we'd love it if you'd also give us a five-star review, kind of show your enthusiasm for uh, genealogy and this podcast. We really appreciate that. I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and of course, you can visit me over at my website, genealogygems.com. There you'll find the Genealogy Gems podcast and a link over to the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. Until next time, have fun climbing your family tree.